Hello. Uh, this Hi. is like an experiment for us because we. This is gonna maybe be a radio show. We don't know. This is yeah. like this is like a like a playground for us, so we can just try things. This is like a really. Yeah. We, so so these <laughs> these two mics just just before we dive into the script, these two mics right here, uh, are not pointed at us. They're pointed at you. So any noise that you make, particularly you in the front row, uh, it will be captured by those mics. So please make some noise. Voice your pleasures or your displeasures as we go, because we are going to try and broadcast this uh, as our next podcast. Really? Yeah. Oh. So you ready? <laughs> I didn't know that part. Okay. okay. So let's make sure I got everything. Please. Is it on and everything? Yep. Okay. You ready? Yep. Hey, I'm Jad Abumrad. I'm Robert Krilwich. And this is Radio Lab Live. Okay. So we, you probably know, because we advertise it this way, that we are going to give you an evening of robots. Or Roberts. Or Roberts, yes. Um, yes. But we, we want to set the scene a little bit and give you a, a, just a flavor of what we're really going to be up to this evening with all of you. Uh, because so, at Radio Lab, we, uh, we, we spend a lot of time... Probably too much time, actually. Yeah. Probably so. Yeah. Uh, over the years, we have... We have we have looked at the line between truth and, and fiction, between uh, realness and fakeness, in all kinds of different places. Uh, in wrestling, in uh, war photography, YouTube videos. We did a whole thing about uh, uh, a mall in Kenya and a terror attack and how it played out there. And, and several years back, we did a show really that, that sort of focused. It actually got a little bit of a lovesick look at, at this question. Yeah, just to sort of recap, we had a guy uh, fooled into thinking he was emailing with a, a Russian lady. Oh, so it was getting serious. Oh, yeah, I, of course. Well. I, I, then what happened? Well, two months passed, and I, I began to feel uncomfortable. Something wasn't right. I would say something like... Did you get my letter about me coming to Moscow in April? Or tell me more about this friend of yours that you mentioned. And she did not. She was still replying with fairly long emails, but they were kind of rambling in general. Then, at some point, a little bell went off in my head, finally, and I started to send some emails which, uh, let's say, included random alphabet letters. Wait a second, so you say, how, what are you wearing tonight? Are you wearing a DBGGGGLP? Exactly, and it didn't make any difference. <laughs> and that's when I realized Ivana was not a person. Ivana was a computer program. I had been had. It was a simpler time. Anyhow, we began that story with that, uh, with that story of dating gone wrong. We moved on to other stories uh, about other kinds of uh, bots and how even the people who knew they were talking to a robot, who even built that robot, couldn't stop treating it like a human, like a therapist, in one example, uh, where they would tell this bot therapist called Eliza secrets. This is an actual transcript between Eliza and a young woman. Yeah, men are all alike. In what way? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here. He says I'm depressed much of the time. I'm so sorry to hear you are depressed. It's true. It's true. I'm unhappy. Do you think coming here will help you not to be unhappy? Oh, I need some help. That much seems certain. What would it mean to you if you got some help? Perhaps, Perhaps I could learn to get along with my mother. Tell me more about your family. Wow. Okay, so, so, so you can see it can get a little confusing when you don't exactly know who you're talking to. But in that show, we, um, we got really down to brass tacks. We came through a literal showdown between the real and the fake, which was called the Loebner, L-O-E-B-N-E-R prize. Yes, and to explain the Loebner prize and all the issues around it, uh, we want to talk to a guy who actually was in it, a Loebner champion. Please welcome to the stage writer Brian Christensen, uh, who uh, He's going to appear here. through a door. He was in the original show. <laughs> so, so just so we can just, just get things sort of oriented, uh, we need to first of all just redefine for ourselves and for the audience what a, what a chat box bot is. Right. So a chat bot is a computer program uh, that exists to mimic and impersonate human beings. Um, so Alan Turing famously imagined in 1950 that we would one day uh, face this question of interacting with two, you know, 
Uh, two different entities. One is a random stranger hidden in a room down the hall. The other is this chatbot program that's pretending to be a random stranger hidden in a room down the hall. Mm -hmm. And he makes this famous prediction back in 1950 that we'll eventually get to a point sometime around the beginning of the, this century where we'll stop being able to tell the difference. Well, what specifically was his sort of prophecy? His specific prophecy was that by the year 2000, uh, after five minutes of interacting by text message uh, with a human on one hand and a chatbot on the other hand, 30% uh, of judges would fail to tell which was the human and which was the robot. And before we focus in on that, I just so I uh, get a sense of chat boxes, bots everywhere. Like, when do I run into them? Right, so I think this is one of the most interesting things about the, this idea, which has now become known as the Turing test, which is that when Alan Turing first proposes it in 1950, this is like a philosophical thought experiment. You know, actual computers are nowhere in society the way they are now. Um, and so here we find ourselves uh, living in a society where you have these chatbots, these kind of spam chatbots online fooling people like this guy dating this woman, Ivana, who turns out to be this chatbot that was probably designed to try to get his credit card number. Um, you she had went slow about it, though. <laughs> I mean, she was a slow, that, slow... That seemed like the long con yeah. there, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you go to a website to interact with some customer service. You might find yourself talking to a chatbot. Um, the U.S. Army has a chatbot called Sergeant Star that recruits people. Now, can I ask you a question about, about the, the, set, the thing you just said about chatting with customer service? Yeah. Which I, I end up doing a lot. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> which is, I, uh, you know, like it's in the middle of the night, you're trying to figure out some program and it's not working, and then suddenly there's like, need to chat? And you click on that. What do you mean suddenly there's need to chat? Well, it's like you, you're... Uh, Whatever. Okay. I assume <laughs> many of you have had this experience. Uh, I've had very few series. of the experiences that he's had, so there's just a, <laughs> that issue always. I'm always curious. It, it, what, it seems very human when you're having that, that conversation with, it, with a, a customer service chat bot. Is there, a, is there a place where it... Where is the line between human and robot? It seems that they're both present. Yeah, well, th this is the question, right? So we're now sort of accustomed to having this uncanny feeling of not really knowing the difference. My mm -hmm. guess, for what it's worth, is that there's a system on the back end that's designed to sort of do triage, where the first few exchanges that are just like, hey, how can I help? What's going on? It seems like there's an issue with the such and such. Um, that is basically just a chat bot, which is more or less the equivalent of going through a phone tree, um, where you like press five for this. In, mm -hmm. in this case, it's just structured as a dialogue, where you're saying, my slideshow doesn't work, or I can't log on to the same thing. Um, and at a certain point, you kind of seamlessly transition and are handed off to a real person, mm. but without any you know, notification to you that this has happened. And suddenly, the person claiming to be John or whatever is, in fact, some guy named John, or maybe it's someone, someone with a different name, but um, you are seamlessly handed off from a chatbot to a person and it's, it's deliberately left opaque at what point that happens. Wow. And is this the same technology that you'd find in Hello Barbie when the yeah, dog exactly. talks to you? Exactly. Is it, is it when Siri just tells you where the next pizza parlor is coming up on your road trip? That's the same thing? Yeah, yeah. So this is literally we, everywhere. It is. I mean, and you can't get on social media and read some comment thread without someone accusing someone else of being a bot. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it seems... Uh, it seems maybe sort of trivial at some level, but we are now living through this political crisis of how, how do we kind of come to terms with the idea that um, we can, you know, weaponize this kind of speech and mm -hmm. how do we as consumers of the news or as users of social media try to suss out whether the people were interacting with are, in fact, who they say they are. I just out of curiosity, just you listening, like, uh, for how many of you just by show of hands have actually asked the thing you were talking to whether they were human or not? <laughs> a few, but not, not the majority. That's interesting. Because, like, Simon, one of the guys here was just telling me he went to a hotel in Las Vegas. There was going to be chiclets or something on the pillow. Chocolates, probably, not chiclets. <laughs> and, um, and the, you know, Hannah, Hannah, or, or something like that, 
was going to provide. So Haim Hama, if you need anything else, if you need a circle, you know, more cleaner she texted sheets. Him. Texted yeah. him, mm -hmm. and he thought he wrote her like, "Are you real or are you just like?" And she said, "A little bit of both." <laughs> yeah. So what's the Loebner Prize? What is that? Okay, so the Loebner Prize uh, is an annual Turing test competition. So Turing in 1950 comes up with this idea. Hey, we should, you know, imagine if we got some judges together, had them chatting for five minutes, some of them with computers, some with humans, and then they would try to figure out who was who. Um, and this just existed as kind of a part of the, the philosophy of computer science until the early 1990s, when into the story steps Hugh Loebner, a rogue multimillionaire disco dance floor salesman. <laughs> A what? <laughs> a, a rogue millionaire uh, plastic portable light up disco dance floor salesman. Like you mean like, like the Bee Gees kind of? Sa like, yeah. Wow. The, the lighting, the floor yeah. that lights up? But portable. <laughs> but portable. You can, make a, you can be a rogue millionaire from that? There's apparently millions to be made if, if, only, if only you knew. Um, oh, wow. And um, Hugh Loebner, this eccentric millionaire, uh, decides that, w this was in a, about 1992, that the technology was starting to get to the point where it would be worth not just talking about the Turing test as this thought experiment, but actually convening a group of people in a room once a year to actually run the test. And, and what is the test? Um, so you get a, a panel of uh, judges together. They're often scientists, but sometimes they're lay people. Um, and they have a sequence of two text message conversations um, with entities that they can't see. One is a random stranger. Uh, the other is a chatbot that's claiming that it is the random human stranger and the other person is in fact the chatbot. So now you have these two conversations. Both are saying, I'm the human, pick me. The other guy's lying to you, he's the chatbot. Mm. And you're supposed to do what? After five minutes, you uh, decide which of these two you thought was the real person. After five minutes of, of, of just hello, saying, how are you, what's your name, what do you, what, what's your sign? Sort of thing. Yeah, it's, it's some, some judges approach it like an interrogation where they'll give you like these brain teaser problems. Other judges approach it like a kind of awkward first date where they're just trying to be like, so what are you into? Like, what are you <laughs> <laughs> and you said earlier that Turing had this number 30, like that was important to him right. in some way, which I assume kind of factors into the Loebner Prize. Why 30? Um, Turing was making just sort of a cultural point. He, he predicts uh, in 1950 that by the year 2000, um, these judges would be choosing incorrectly 30% of the time. So. 50% of the time would be no better than chance. Um, so they, they wouldn't be able to distinguish which was which. Um, and that's not a good, because that's like a nightmare? Like if people have no idea whether something is real or not, like literally. It feels like in the suburbs of nightmare, but not full nightmare. I mean, if you, if you get over 50%, that means they're more often picking the computer than the person. That starts to feel like a nightmare. Um, yeah. Okay, so but thir what is 30 just like a soft 30 is kind just of what Turing imagined, and by Turing's own fame and stature, this has been sort of etched into the history books as what it means to quote unquote pass the Turing test. And so he predicted that as a result of hitting this 30% threshold, we would reach a point, he writes, where one would speak of machines as being intelligent without expecting to be contradicted. Hmm. And, and has it, like, when we last talked to you, what, what, when did we last, when was it, 2011? 2011. 2011. So at that point, had anybody gotten the 30% with a? The, the highest computer program in the Loebner Prize had gotten, uh, had fooled 25% of a judging panel one year. And by the way, uh, is a judging panel just like, you know, Janice and Albert and some guy you found on a bus somewhere, or are they professors so Nobody anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Jasper, maybe. Jasper. What is Janice? I, I, don't, I just I made that up. But <laughs> so who are the judges? Are, are, they, are they respectable, pedigreed men and women of the, uni of the academe? Or they are, they are often some combination of just lay people that they pull in off the street well, or random or, scientists. Or, yeah, okay. so often the Loebner Prize is kind of co-located with some sort of science conference. So they'll just put up flyers that are like, hey, do you want to participate in this weird <laughs> thing? Come to this room, you know, on 3 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, but then, you know, if, if trout fishermen aren't going to see that sign, so you're not going to get them. Probably. That's right. Yeah. Right. Okay, so, but do you think, like, it's a sort of a sophisticated set of judges as the world turns? I mean, if it's Well, this is part of the question. So, you know, one of the things that makes the Turing test complicated is that it doesn't offer a kind of uh, objective standard the way that other scientific, you know, endeavors would want. It's, it's measured by the, whoever happens to show up. And mm -hmm. so... There have been years where the organizers recruited children and non-native English speakers. I, I suspect to kind of deliberately stir some controversy um, over, you know, what what constitutes a valid running of the Turing test. Well, putting that 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 si aside for a second, so 25 percent you said was was 2011. Ha has it? Have we passed the 30 percent thresholds in the intervening eight years? So. It, in 2014, there was a Turing test competition that was held at which the top computer program managed to fool 30% of the judges. Wow. And so... That's it, right? Depending on how you want to interpret that result, some people have immediately gone and said, well, there it is, the Turing test has been passed. Well, was Other that like people, school yeah. children brought in by a bus, half-crazed Albanian dwarfs on a vacation? <laughs> or was that like real people? Well, th this is that... I mean, sorry. I mean... <laughs> uh, <laughs> What, those are the <laughs> Sir Henry Higgins kind of people. Um, the, oh, God, I'm the just real, dug a hole there, didn't I? I'm just, we're just going to keep going. The, the controversy arose in this particular year because the chatbot that won was itself claiming to be a 13-year-old Ukrainian who was just beginning to get a grasp on the English language. Oh, oh. so the machine was cheating. Well, yeah. So this, I mean, this it was really like broken English and, and didn't yeah. know a lot about Eisenhower. Right. Or Adenauer. Or yes. Whatever. Yeah. Right. Well, that's interesting. Okay. So it masked its computerness by in broken grammar. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Right. Or, it, or if it didn't appear to understand your question, you started to have this story you could play in your own mind of like, oh, well, maybe I didn't phrase that quite right or something. And I think this, I mean, to me, what's interesting about this is that it points to this question of, you know, if the Turing test is in some sense dependent on the ability of the actual people to make good conversation, um, what does that mean? Because yeah. that's a standard that can sort of shift over time. Has it been broke, has, the, has it, there been a second winner, or a third winner, or a fourth winner? Um, to the best of my knowledge, we are still sort of flirting under that threshold. So we're, it's not commonplace for us to hold one of these contests and hit that 30% mark. But I think what really is remarkable, as we were saying earlier, is against this kind of uneven and halting progress of the actual contest, we have this backdrop of a culture in which, you know, pretty much everyone in this room has expressed, you know, when I go online, I have this weird question mark in my mind of, am I dealing with a real person or not, or is it a bot? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the kind of thing that, you know, would have probably shocked Alan Turing, had he li himself lived into the 21st century, was that, you know, this, this thing that started as a thought experiment has become part of the, like, cultural immune system um, mm -hmm. of what it means to just navigate the world in, in the 21st century. Well, since you mentioned us, and uh, why don't we just do this? Since, since we haven't had any victories since 2014 for, for Turing, let, we thought we might just do this right here. We just right here in this room, do our own little Turing test. All we need is a volunteer. So let me just, before anyone raises their hand, I just need one person, anyone in the room. Um, your, your job will be to go to this machine and text something that is, well, two things will be, will be within your reach. One will be a computer, one will be a person. You won't know which, you'll just have to ask it questions. And then we will all do this test. So this is like, is there anybody who would just like to just give it a shot? Um, I can see one hand over there. I'm supposed to. Like, I'm not, I, I don't want to get the first hand. I guess. Like, <laughs> what uh, about this person over here on the left? He, he, this one right the, the back of the white. The right. Yes. Okay. Come on. Uh, come on up here and just come on up here. Don't tell me your name because I can't remember why, but I was instructed not to ask your name for some psychological reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just go and st stand behind that uh, that that computer and just take a look at the computer. Now, if you look, if you look, do I have a, a microphone in my own or am I just grab it yeah, off the thing? You, and I should go back here, right? You should, yes, you should leave because here's the thing. What's going to happen is you're, we are going to help you and you're going to go and quiz 
either nobody or him. Okay. You won't know which. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I know we're going to give you a time limit. Yeah, you can't okay. be here all evening. Uh, right. You guys, like to, do I have like a, a, a hand? Oh, I do. Okay. Guys, back there. I have some guys over here. Right, so I'm going to just I'm going to just help you just sort of stand over here next to you. And um, so let me just see what I'm supposed to do here. First of all, everybody, take a look at you should too at the screen. Now you'll see that we have two options. We've just labeled them for one reason by color. One is strawberry. The other is blueberry or code red and code blue. Each of them could be either, uh, well, this would be Jad or Robot, but that didn't have any, that didn't have any <laughs> poetry to its, you know, the consonant. <laughs> Jad or, is there a machine that's a J machine? No. Okay, Robert or Robot or Robert or Robot, but it's Blueberry or Strawberry. So you'll be talking to, can you do this? Are you one of these multitaskers? Do you think you can talk to both of them at the same time, just jump from one to the other? Sure, yeah. Sure, why not? I can't do that. All right, so you, she can, um, So what we're gonna do is I just want you to begin just a second. Before you do, like, have you got any sort of thoughts of how you could suss out whether the thing was a person or a thing? Yeah, I have some thoughts. I mean, like, my first tactics are gonna be, like, sort of, like, very human emotional questions, and then we'll like go from there. See what. See I, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but I'm not going to ask because I don't want to. I don't want to lose your inspiration. I'm try to therapize this robot. All right. So when I say go, you'll just go, and I'll just narrate what you're doing. Okay. Okay. okay th three, two, one, begin. Oh, by the way, could you, I think we want one thing else. I was told. All right. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I was, I was, I was given a lot of instructions. One of them is just say hi to each of them individually. That somehow triggers something about this that will set it off. So this is a hi, this is going to begin by saying hi. Then I say go. Go. Hi, Strawberry. We don't say it, you no, have to yeah, type I... it. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know, we're not that sophisticated. Although actually we have like some of the best, we have some of the best engineering team in the world doing this thing with us here tonight. So um, let's see how she's gonna go. We're gonna. You see all my typos? No, you know, typos might be some kind of a trick you might want to use, you know? Ooh. Typos might be really human of you or... Okay, so <laughs> you've gotten your first... <laughs> well, we've got a somewhat sexual response here. <laughs> the machine has said, I like strawberries, and then you've returned with strawberries are delicious, and oh, now it's getting warmer over there. <laughs> blue is a warmer, as a cooler color. Maybe you'd like to go and we discuss Aristotle with uh, the blueberry. <laughs> Okay, let's see, here we go, we have, uh, i just read you a hi there, hmm, I like strawberries, strawberries are delicious, me too, why, that's the exchange on the strawberry side. Uh, she seems puzzled by blueberry, and, um, I have, I have oh, there, oh, there is, hi, blue, hi, bluesy bee, okay, that's also a kind of, a, a kind of a generous sort of opener. Yeah, see if this, hi, this bluesy bee. has a nickname. Oh, yeah, okay, let's see whether, whether it responds. It is taking its time trying to figure out whether it is or is not Blue ZB. Hi there, I just realized I don't even know who I'm talking to. What is your name? Oh, see, now this is, go ahead and I guess tell it. No one told me you couldn't tell it your name. Okay, then you're gonna answer Zandra. I am not in your, am I not in your phone? <laughs> <laughs> And the, the blueberry has responded with a, a bit of shock. <laughs> Very nice name, Zandra. Uh, that was not... <laughs> so things are going kind of warm on both sides of this conversation. Um, are you beginning to think? Are you beginning to... Ha Don't even tell me, but are you beginning to have an inclination one way? One of these is a machine. One of these is a human. One of them is, in fact, Jada Bumrad hiding in a smoky glass case over there. We continued a lot to see what happens. My mom's hair was red. Well, that's an interesting answer to strawberries are red and red is a primary color. What is your... Maybe he's going to think I'm a robot. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> well, you have to worry that you don't want to come off as a robot, I don't think, unless maybe you do. I mean, that could be a strategy all by itself. Okay, so uh, let's see. Well, I don't have a mother, says the strawberry. <laughs> What's your favorite memory of your mother? Which is sort of a non sequitur, if they are happy. <laughs> Over on the blue side, I'm not certain whether I can give an accurate reply or not to uh, whether you are talking to me from a computer. 
what's wrong, boo? Nothing's wrong with me. Is there something wrong with you? Hmm. So now, let's just, uh, don't, don't tell me how, but just give me a sense of what you're thinking. Do you think you have a hunch? One of these is alive and one of them isn't? I'm feeling blueberry is less alive. You're than feeling strawberry. blueberry is less alive. Okay, let's or do Or like it. at least less creative, but who knows if that. <laughs> <laughs> if that uh, let's do, I'll that. give you 30 more seconds to say anything you want to either of them and then we'll bring it to a conclusion. Okay. Um, and we'll see whether uh, you can tip the scales. So far, it's looking like maybe Jad is a blueberry, is what we're thinking. Um, Nothing is wrong with me. Is there something wrong with you? When can I see you, says you say to Blueberry, who's been somewhat standoffish. Meanwhile, <laughs> on the strawberry side... I cannot believe him right now. You don't believe... Right now, as far as I know, not unless you have x-ray vision, I'm in the room next to you. Oh, he's trying to coax you into thinking that he's Jad. Is that That's Blueberry. They, is that something they do? I don't know. I... <laughs> There, you're at the heart of the question. I'm going to ask you to bring this to a conclusion in one more exchange, and then we're done in 10, 9, 8, mm. 7. I can go slower. <laughs> six and a half, six, five and a half, four and a half to three, two and one. And then I think one is very close to half, and then there's a quarter, and then we go beep. Okay. So let me just quickly look over the last exchanges on the blueberry side. Nothing is wrong with me. Is there anything wrong with you? When can I see you? Right now, as far as I know, you can see me. Not unless you have x-ray vision. I'm in the room next to you. Come on. I'm just kidding around. That's on the blueberry side. On the raspberry, strawberry side, I don't have a mother. Well, what's your favorite memory of your mother? My mother was born in an electric static around a star. It was glorious. My mom was too. What color was her hair? Red, naturally. I hate that color. Okay, so you end on a kind of negative note with a strawberry and... Um, well, no, listen, Blueberry and I have a lot going on. <laughs> who are you going to declare to be the machine and who are you going to declare to be up. the human? Take your time. This is, a, this is the beginning of history Science. that we were hoping to make. <laughs> what are you doing? Hmm. I'm just trying to read it again to see if I know who was... Okay. I'm going to force you to a conclusion pretty soon. <laughs> let me just, while you're thinking, let me just ask you guys, how many of you think that Jad is Blueberry? A few of you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, thirteen. How many of you think that Jad is Strawberry? Overwhelming. Wow. Does that affect? Oh, I shouldn't. Yeah, I actually, I actually was leaning more towards strawberry now, and now everybody thinks it's strawberry. Well, no, that was wrong of me to do that, wasn't it? <laughs> what do you think? Are you going to vote? Go ahead, vote. I'm going to do strawberry. Okay, strawberry, strawberry this way, strawberry that way. Now let me ask, stra well, let me ask, Jed, would you please declare yourself on either of the screens? Wait, strawberry is the robot. Strawberry is the robot. Oh, strawberry is the robot, you say? And, and blueberry is the, is Jad. Is that what we all agreed? Yeah. No. Oh, you're, you're, uh, you're against the crowd here. Okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. <laughs> Much better theater. All right, uh, Jad Abumrad, where, where, which one are you? I am actually, says somebody on the blue side. Uh, what is, I am actually what? <laughs> They're both the same thing. I am actually strawberry. I am, oh, strawberry. that was a, a poem of some sort? <laughs> the humans are correct. All right. Come on out. I've definitely never had that much chemistry with something that was human. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're, we're gonna, wait, wait, before you leave, we're going to give you a tote bag. I'll, I'll just ask you, do you have anything you want to say to each other? Like, uh... Here. Wait, were you one of them? You I, were neither was, of them. I was strawberry. You were a strawberry. I, 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 I was right. just... I thought I just... It, I was inspired to mess with you at yeah. the end and say I was blueberry, but I was, I was strawberry. So you could get on blueberry, though. I could have been either. <laughs> and for a moment, I was both. 
Sorry, that's totally, I broke the rules. I, I know, I know. It was, I was back there by myself. No one was policing my bed. I just... You dabbled on both sides? I, I was having a very so human... is it always going to be a mix? Maybe that's what it is. No, no, no. <laughs> Mr. Hubner, who, by the way, passed away recently, at, you know, I'm not, I hope not on a dance floor. Or maybe I hope it was on a dance floor. <laughs> very disappointed in you. I, I messed it all up. Uh, well, all right. But you did get it right. Yes. You, Congratulations. Did she get a tote bag? Gets a tote bag. We got a... Yeah, there we go. All right. Well, from some humble beginnings... Uh, oh, here. I think I, I put this down. I have lost my script. Did someone back there have a script? Oh, go get it. it it's back in that room, probably. Anyhow, oh, Here it comes. Here it comes. Simon Adler. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do this now with everybody. But I think now th in the everybody version, I, this is um, we're gonna do the same thing. Every one of you get, can get to do it too. First, remember you were given an envelope when you came in here. I want you to take out the envelope and hold it in your lap. Yes. When, take when you open it, don't show it to your neighbor. Yes. Look at the number that is on your envelope. Only you. Take that number deep into your soul. Take it all the way in. It'll be a ten-digit number. And the next thing you'll want to do is you'll want to, once you've got it out, mm -hmm. is you want to take out your cell phone. That's a wonderful sound of paper rustling, secrets yes. being stored. Keep the secret safe from your neighbor and uh, take out your cell phones. So as you see, you're going to have a 10-digit number on that paper, which only you are looking at right now. That is a phone number. Each number is associated. There are, there are a bunch of different numbers uh, spread throughout the audience. Each of those numbers is associated with either a chatbot, or a real person. And don't, what, what we're, what we're going to do, don't start yet, but what we're going to do is you're going to have two minutes to text with the entity on the other end of that line, who you don't know if they are real or, uh, or, or, or machine. Now we have arranged for uh, a, a, a superflu, a surfite, a surf, a too many people <laughs> to intimidate you. We, we are going to bring a whole bunch of humans onto the stage just simply as a backdrop. They will all be carrying cell phones as well. Some of you will be talking to them. Others of you will not be talking to them, but we thought it'd be interesting if you could just look at them. These are the people you may or may not be texting in the next few minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, these are, these are members of the Radio Lab and More Perfect crews up there. <laughs> they are going to be the humans. Those of you who are, whose numbers uh, attach to humans, they will be the people you are chatting with. I'm going to join their ranks myself as well. Uh, before Jed joins, or as Jed joins, let me just ask you, Brian, just for a little, while you, you guys are getting ready, because you, you know, maybe in a minute I'll ask you just for a show of hands whether you're ready, but do you have any, like, if you wish to uh, suss out whether a thing that you're talking to is human or no, have you over the years come up with a, a, a way to do secret it? Secret tactics. Secret tactic. Um, yes, I would say one of the things to, to bear in mind is that a lot of these chatbot programs are essentially cobbled together out of transcripts of many, many, many different human conversations. You can sort of think of them as a conversational wiki. Um, and so there may be moments where you say something and there's an uncannily good response, but later responses seem almost as if to be coming from someone else. And so in, in, in a case like that, it's, it's not so much a question of deciding you're not talking to a human as not talking to a human. Ah. So you're, like um, so you're, uh, you're talking to the entire internet is what you're saying? Exactly, you're yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're effectively talking to the internet. So anything that you say, if it has been said several times before, is just going to become a pattern, part of a pattern. Right. So what if, what if you think of something that's completely, like if you think like, I am eating a spaghetti and frog sandwich now, with a blue ribbon uh, tying the two sides together. How do you have your sandwiches? Like you, I don't think anybody would have said that before. That might be new on the yeah, internet. Yeah, that might be yeah. new. <laughs> and then, um, like, the hope is that then, then, then the robot will go, <gasps> I don't know what to do about that. Like, but you also have to make sure it's not so weird that a human would, would not themselves go, uh, I have no idea what to say to that. <laughs> That's true. What, so about, like, what about, like, just putting in six brackets and... and, and, and and 13 exclamation points or something like that would be just frankly weird punctuation wise yeah you you have to sort of anticipate what you think a human response to receiving that would be 
I'm, <laughs> which, right. I'm not that's totally right. certain that I know what I would be expecting. Oh, that's the Because sometimes, it, uh, the way a lot of these systems are designed, there's sort of like a emergency catch-all thing, where if they have no idea what to do, they might just say, like, I don't know what you're talking about, but anyway. Yes. Um, and that... Yeah, that then maybe close much. to so yeah. this is this is part of the of the trick is how to figure out how to say something that has effectively never been said before on the internet and yet can be woven into some sort of thread of conversation. Okay. That that adds up to something. So we are. Are we? Can I just have a show you? Are you ready to do this? Just are you all prepared? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to just say I don't. We don't. I'll just make this like two two and a half minutes something like that. So here we go. Get ready. Get set. And off you go. And I don't know what to do during this period <laughs> because this is a radio program and we can't exactly allow the people at home to sit there staring at the ceiling. They're far from their phones and far from you and far from everybody else. So I'm going to just walk around and look over people's shoulders to see if I can spy what might be going on. For this particular woman here in row 13, you just decided to come in here to get out of the cold. Oh, you didn't get an envelope. Oh, shh. Okay, sorry. Okay. We can get her an envelope. Here we have an extra envelope for her. And now we can flood her with envelopes. Do you want to do this too much? No, no, no. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to uh, see how far along. You're, you're getting going? Yeah, but what my thought is, if what if it's the wrong number? Like, I actually typed it wrong, and I'm just texting a random person. <laughs> you might be talking to a real person who's nothing to do with this experiment. Yeah, there are a thousand ways to get this wrong, quite clearly. Let's see. And you're doing, uh, I love lamp. I love lamp. That's good. It's not a sentence that anyone would normally, I mean, but there's usually an article. I love the lamp, a lamp, something like that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, you're so forgiving. Okay, well, let's see what happens. Again, we're continuing along. Some of you may be talking to nobody. Some of you may be talking to one of these people up here who are all carefully adorned except for Jad, with silver bonnets. I'm not quite sure. Well, those are their antennae, I guess, symbolically, and that's what they're doing. I'm going to come over here. We have about 35, 40 seconds left. I just have a show of hands. How many people are thinking anything at this point? Thinking maybe yes, maybe no? A few. Okay, okay, okay. Some of you are going. So we're going to go into the latter half of this. Like, see. Oh, you're busy, Jack. You're doing, like, a back and forth. Hmm. That's a very nice name, Eva. You've changed the subject, only temporarily, and your name, my name is Millie. Oh, several of these, I keep going. I'm here way in the, in the back row. I know these two people. <laughs> Look at Molly is... Oh my gosh, who's here? Oh, so they do. So Molly's asking whether they know who we, who Jan and I are, and that whoever this, this, Oh, wow. Now, that would be weird to have the computer know our names. <laughs> uh, I mean, they would never, uh, that would be very strange. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. Um, I'm going to count down from 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 2019, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, switching mics, 12, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, beep. That is the end of the, uh, that is the end of your exploration. Now what I'd like everybody to do, if it's possible, I'd like you all to stand up all together. There's a reason for this. Everybody just rise from your seat, and I'm going to ask you a question. If you think that you were texting a machine, if you think you were talking to a machine, would you now please sit down? Okay. Now, I have a very specific set of instructions, which are so complicated I don't begin to understand them. So, listen carefully. I'm going to read out, we're going to read out and project the last four digits of some phone numbers. So if you are currently standing and you hear your number read and you see it on the screen, if you hear your number read and see it on the screen, you will we will ask you to sit down. 
If you think you were chatting with a human, and you see your number on the screen, that will be the reason we're asking you to sit down. If, however, you are currently sitting down right now, I hope you're following this. <laughs> you're currently sitting down right now, and you hear your number read, and you see it on the screen, then we want you to stand up. In the end, what's going to happen is everybody who's wrong will be standing. There's two ways to be wrong here, so that's, that's the, the big deal. So once again, if you're currently standing, and you hear your number read, sit down. If you're currently sitting, and you hear your number read, stand up. Shall I read the numbers? Please do. Zero three three seven five three zero zero nine three one one two zero seven five. Who's this is exciting? Nine six two one five seven six seven one seven one one four three two zero nine seven zero six four two one zero four four one five seven seven two zero eight four 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 seven six six nine. And those are just the last four numbers. I don't know what that means, but that's Simon, and he knows everything that's actually going on here. <laughs> now, Simon, does this mean that the people who remain standing at this moment are, were, have been, all the way through, wrong about their assumptions? And the people who are sitting are right about their assumptions? So if you are standing, and, that, and you texted with one of the numbers up there, you, you should be, you should have, now you've got me <laughs> 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 Better use Simon than me. <laughs> no, no, no. So, yeah, go ahead and say that again. Okay, so everybody at the beginning stood up. We then had everyone sit down who believed they were chatting with a bot. Right. So it should only have been the people who were, in fact, talking or who thought they were talking to humans left standing up. Everyone standing up right now, you thought you were talking to a human? Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, there were only... Oh, 50 no? Wait, some of them some okay, okay, get okay. to differ. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get there in one second. Okay. All of you standing up who thought you were talking with a human, chatting with a human, uh, do you see your number on there? The last four digits of the number you were texting with? No. Okay, then, then you are wrong. <laughs> that, that, that's the first but thing. But stay where you are. Now, does what about any, the other group? Yeah, and does anyone who thought they were chatting with a bot... Uh, see their number up there. The last four digits of the phone number you were texting with. I, I got a yes over here on the left. Okay, you are also wrong. So you who are wrong, please stand up, even if you are sitting down now, stand up, because stand up and be wrong. Okay, so we're now looking, I believe, now Simon, tell me about it, we're now looking, the upright citizens in this room are the wrong guys, yes. and the seated people are the right guys. Correct. So that means that roughly... God, I think like 45% of the people were wrong, I meaning that... we just passed the test. We just passed the test. I, I think that's it. We did it. All right, you can... You can. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Why are our results skewed? Say, so, ask again? We got, neither of us got a response at all, so what does that mean? You know, I think there was some... I think a couple oh, of texts... Okay, we have a few incidental... Uh, procedural problems but then again in this kind of a business you always do some people got no response at all from the from the machine or from anyone so they just sat in total silence okay, okay. so that is the we can call that the control group from Afghanistan <laughs> I don't know why we have it but it's just all we always have one of those so thank you very much for not getting any, any exchange of any sort that was probably science also but I don't know how so now, just out of curiosity, for those of you who were right, can you just show of hands? I was right, I was right, I was right, yeah. Uh, I'm going to just give you a one to three choice here. I felt right all the way through, I felt right somewhere in the middle, or I felt right only at the very end. I felt right all the way through. A lot. I felt my right in only in the middle. A few. I felt right very, very at the end. Okay, so the always rights were, were uh, emphatic. Most of the always rights, you can, are, are you, is this a question? I have a question though. Oh, okay. There were 10 people on the stage, and there are more numbers on the, on the screen than 10. Well, that, yes, some of them were, yeah. uh, were, were machines masquerading as humans. No, no, no. no but she's saying I'm No. <laughs> oh, wait, these are, these are me. Oh, okay. Simon, give Simon the mic. So the question again. <laughs> Simon will explain that because it was very thought through and I think we probably should it was let him... Quite thought through, yes. No, everybody, uh, all those numbers are associated with people. Not all the people could be here tonight. We have some people upstairs who are beavering away at whatever they're working on, texting you and interrupting their 
workflow. Oh. So, so you some, of be these were, some of these were, were stand ins or mock people. No, no they're oh, they all people. All, they just people weren't all they were other people. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I'm just now going to ask you, having been a veteran of this, like, uh, are, you, are you at all surprised, or is this just so far off the charts that it doesn't matter? Well, in this case, we're doing sort of a one-sided version, where you have a single conversation, and then you decide, is it either a person or a robot? Um, in a more sort of fully fleshed out version of uh, the Turing test, you'd have two conversations, and you would know for a certainty that one was a human and one was a robot, and you just have to pick which. Mm -hmm. And in, in some ways, I think, getting it wrong under those conditions is so much more significant because not only have you mistaken a computer for a human, but you've simultaneously, you, you essentially said that you thought the computer was more human than the human. Well, uh, in so real, they, it has this yeah. real yeah, bite to it. In real life, just because like this, this kind of got sort of simple for the ones who were right and pretty much simple for the ones who were wrong, I, even though there was a difference among us. I'm just asking, I think I might have led someone astray, by the way, who assumed that because I didn't acknowledge having a headband on, that I couldn't be on stage. Um, oh, yes. That's so, to say, I didn't realize that you were part of it. I thought it was only that okay. It was a strong. It was a strong opening gambit. I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> you, you were like uh, eleven twelfths likely to be correct. I, I think the, the truth of it is, just to get a little sober for a second, is that is that in real life it's still a very hard thing to figure out. Right? We are nowhere close to having anything. So you, for example, have a story about your own Twitter ID, Twitter yeah, handle. Yeah. So this this really hit home for me on Twitter, which is a, a place where bots thrive. Um, <laughs> and I, w I had become very keenly interested in the Twitter handle at Brian Christian, um, which I coveted. And um, the user of that handle was just tweeting in Cyrillic, the Cyrillic alphabet, and I ran them through Google Translate. And they just seemed to be like ads for discounts on weird, you know, pharmaceutical products and things like this. And so I sent a, a notification to the Twitter you know, abuse uh, line or whatever, saying, I think this account is being used for basically just spam. That's um, very self-serving of you. Very <laughs> selflessly <laughs> motivated by my desire to just purloin the handle for myself. Mm. Which um, they probably could tell from your signature, unless you called was, yourself Millie Tweet or something. Yeah, no, it was, it, I, it was pretty clear that, yeah. I, that I had some ulterior motives. But um, they shut down the account. And I said, oh, this is wonderful. And they sent me an email saying, yes, you're right. This was a you know, fraudulent account. And so I went to take the handle. And now there was someone else using the handle. How, how come? This, well, I don't know. I mean, they just pounced? I was beaten to the punch, yes. Oh. And how quickly? It, like in an hour? Or? In the time it took me to like, find that I had gotten this email from Twitter. Oh. And so now there was a new account there that, at, at Brian Christian. And this one claimed to be, the bio said, like, just a regular American. Um, <laughs> and they were tweeting in English, but they were tweeting things about how, you know, the Mueller investigation was just a, you know, this giant sham. And, um, you know, no, no one could ever prove that Russia had even involved, been involved in meddling, uh, let alone collusion or anything more serious than that. Um, that the whole thing was just a waste of time. Um, and this included some like weird grammatical mistakes and things like this. And then there were some tweets that were just like very passionately articulating the difference between socialism and communism, <laughs> which is not a thing that the American right really is passionate about, like <laughs> differentiating. Um, I mean, it's just not, it's just <laughs> orthogonal to American politics. Um, and so, for all of these reasons, there I was started also a reference feeling. to the congressman, right? Uh, yeah, there was there were several references to like I th I think my congressman or my representative is doing a good job, and like no one talks that way, um, <laughs> like just continually referring to this person, but without naming them, as if as if they didn't want to be pinned down to a specific <laughs> electoral district. Um, so I started to have my doubts that this was indeed an American man, as it. Claimed. Did you did you suspect at this point uh, human or 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 machine? You know that's a really good question actually. Um, at some level, I don't really know. My my hunch is that if it is not an American man, uh, that it's someone a, a human being 
um, in one of these kind of like troll farms, um, basically being paid to pump out these tweets. I mean, that, that, this was the other funny thing, was that this person had been tweeting like, you know, every 20 minutes for like years, <laughs> and they only had like 12 followers, and the maximum amount of like engagement on any tweet they'd ever tweeted was like one response. <laughs> and like the, the, the mode amount of reaction was like heavily zero. Well, did um, you call tw Twitter again and say, wait a second? I like, did. Yeah. I did. Again, you know, with a little bit of a mixed motive, uh, I'll admit. Um, and I also showed this account to a friend of mine who's actually an academic who studies Twitter bots and uh, has done a lot of research on this. And he said, I don't know, man. This, this looks like it might just be a lonely guy who's, <laughs> who's just venting. You know, he's got these views that are right of center. You know, he's entitled to his opinions. He's entitled to kind of use Twitter as a place to just vent, even though he has no followers. You know, people use it as a kind of diary. So then so I started feeling really of, bad. Like, I'm trying to take this guy's handle away. It's just some poor guy. So the poor, it's not Dimitri of Sevastopol. It's, it's Gus of, of, of it's, Lorraine, it's Ohio. It's Brian Christian of, or Brian you know, Christian. yeah. Uh, it's an wow. American guy. So you felt um, bad. So then I started feeling bad for trying to tell Twitter to take this thing away. Because I'm like, here's Did you withdraw your request? N you can't, there's no mechanism by which you can withdraw it, but they, di they did not uh, act on it. And then I discovered in uh, late February, there was an event that was called the Twitter, the Great Twitter Lockout, um, where just without any fanfare, Twitter purged, you know, X hundred thousand bot accounts off the service. And this light bulb went off in my mind, and I went back and I looked at the handle at Brian Christian, and it was now empty. Mm. And I thought, oh. I, you know, I felt very vindicated, and I took the handle, and I now have it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it was a bot. Well, I mean, the seed of doubt remains, you know. I mean, you, there were a lot of people after the, the Twitter bot lockout claiming that they were just regular people who had had their accounts um, kind of hijacked by Twitter mm. or, or shut down. And so I am trying to do what I can to figure out if I can track this person down if they in fact exist. Um, and so that, I mean, that's the weird mm -hmm. ending for me is that even after all of this seemingly confirmatory evidence that my hunch was right, I now have this nagging doubt of like, what if it's just some poor guy? And I marched in and just like snatched his handle mm -hmm. and now his, you know, blog has, has been shut down. Um, so I, now I feel like if this is a person, I owe it to them to like give it back. Huh. So <laughs> this is, uh, we may, and we may never know. So this, this is the kind of ambiguity I think that we just all have to live with. Was this with, ambiguity you know? gonna grow because, I, mean, I, I don't know, the, the one way to interpret what just happened in this room is that people you know, were fairly confident, but there was a, quite a bit of a split in the room about it. And are, you think that computers might be getting better at being human, or maybe humans getting more machine-like, and, and therefore there's gonna be some kind of weird m growing middle ground? I think, I think it's probably true that we're meeting somewhere in the middle, for better or worse. I mean, there are still, you know, human communication at its best, um, requires an actual empathy of the person you're talking to. You have a model of their mind and you want to say things that are going to be interesting to them and you want to um, frame an issue differently or talk about it at a different length based on the person you're talking to. So I think, you know, at, at the limit, really reaching human level linguistic competence does require um, all of the hallmarks of intelligence. So I think in that sense, Turing was right to kind of stake the the claim of humanity on this particular domain. Um, but for me, the great irony is that uh, it, at the moment, it seems like the Turing test is getting passed, not because the machines have met us at our full potential, but because we are using ever more and more kind of degraded sort of rote forms of communication with one another. You know, we've gone from interacting in person to talking over the phone, to emailing, to texting, and now, I mean, for me, the great irony is that even to text, your phone is proactively suggesting turns of phrase that it thinks yes. you might want to use. Hmm. 
And so in this way, I mean, in computer science, there's this idea of what's called the no free lunch theorem, which basically means in order to make the common tasks or common phrases easier, you have to simultaneously make the uncommon things harder. And so, I mean, I, I, I assume many people in, in this room have had the experience of trying to text something and you try to say it in a, like a sort of a fun, fanciful way or you try to make some pun where you use a word that's not a real word and your phone just sort of slaps, slaps that <laughs> down and just replaces it with something more normal. And when this happens to me, I think my reaction, which I think is most of our reaction, is like to just be a little bit cowed and be like, okay, you know, I'll just talk like a, you know, a generic person. You know what's really hard is Jad. Like, I write Jad, yeah. and it goes, Jerry, George, Jerry, had. Motor Jam. Right. I can't tell you had. how many emails I get to had. To had. <laughs> yeah. A name, that's, a name that's odd is a name that just, that, that, that no. the machine fights. It's really interesting. So, yeah, for Robert, me, this is no like, problem. Like, hey, Robert, Robert, but Jad. And it's Jad, too, so. Like, boy, if you were to say it in French, then like, a lot of whole other machine. <laughs> what? What? Guess <laughs> out. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, 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 I was yeah, wondering yeah. Whether, whether, is it possible that in, this is getting kind of grim, that maybe, uh, that in some, in some ways chatbots are good for humans? Or? Yeah, I mean, is there any situation where you can throw in a couple of bots and things get better? Yeah, there have been some academic studies on trying to use chatbots for these humane, benevolent ends uh, that I think paint this interesting other narrative. And so, for example, um, researchers have tried injecting chatbots into Twitter conversations that use hate speech. Um, and this bot will just show up and be like, hey, that's not cool. Um, <laughs> Um, and it says it just like that. <laughs> it's not cool, man. You know, it'll say something like, there's, there's real people behind the keyboard, and you're really hurting someone's feelings when you talk that way. Um, and, you know, it's sort of preliminary work, but there are some studies that appear to suggest, you know, this sharp decline in that user's use of hate speech as I mean, just because of, that, of one right? little, oh, I don't think you should say that, in print, like, that's, that's enough? Or do you have, to say, you have to say, I have 50 trillion followers or something like well, that? Well, yeah, it, it actually does depend, so this is interesting, it does depend on the follower count <laughs> of the bot that makes the intervention. So if you perceive this bot to be, well, it also requires that you think they're a person. So this is, this is sort of flirting with, the, with the dark magic a little bit. Um, but if you perceive them to be uh, higher status on the platform than yourself, then you will tend to sheepishly fall in line. But if the bot has fewer followers than the user it's trying to correct, that will just instigate the, the bully to bully them now in addition. Mm. Wow. Um, so, yeah, human nature... It cuts both ways, huh? Yeah. It's well, but we run into, like, you want to tell what? We run into yeah. this very cool thing, and then we're going to finish, but this is, like, the, this is the... This is quite interesting. Well, we got to thinking about... Uh, Sort of the trajectory that you're describing where humans, uh, we, we are going to be sort of all Turing, we're going to, Turing tests will be passed not because the machines are getting better, but because we're getting worse, which is sort of a depressing place to land. We thought, are there instances where um, not so much chatbots, but maybe AI or maybe just technology in general can make us humans even better, can bring out our best angels? And uh, we ran across a story by a guy named Josh Rothman who is a New Yorker writer. Now again, this is not about chatbots, different technology. He wrote about a VR laboratory in Barcelona, Spain, that is quite cool, and we want to tell you sort of uh, that conversation and, that we had with him and the story that he tells. Now this lab, what they do is they use VR for a kind of, uh, for therapy and rehab. Uh, what they'll do is they'll bring you into a black box theater, they'll put the giant VR helmet on you, and then, um, they place you into these virtual worlds and you can walk around in the virtual worlds and you can look up at the virtual sky or you can look down at the virtual ground. And what's interesting is that often in these places, what they will do is they'll place you in an entirely different body. So they'll take you out of your body and they'll put you into a virtual body that's completely different. Like say you're tall in real life, well they'll put you into the body of a, sh uh, a virtual short person so that you're actually suddenly looking up at everybody and you can see what that's like. Or if you're white, they will, they will make you in, uh, into a black person in a virtual uh, world, and you will get to look at a virtual mirror and see your virtual black body and do Tai Chi or something. But, uh, but it will look like you with dark skin. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so they're sort of like measuring the effect that these 
kinds of VR interventions have. And, um, and so Josh went and did one of these things. And uh, it's very interesting. It, what's, what's fascinating is that you go into these situations, they drop you into a new person. And, you know, within minutes, the part of your brain that keeps track of where your limbs are in space and how big and tall you are uh, adjusts instantly. And suddenly, you feel very much inhabiting of this new form. And so Josh goes into this. Uh, he goes into the lab. They put on the helmet. And they place him into this virtual room. I was sitting in a chair in a um, really cool-looking modernist house with glass walls. And through the glass walls, I could see fields with wildflowers. And uh, I was sitting in a chair um, in front of a desk. Um, to the right of the desk was a mirror. So he's in this virtual room, and he's looking at this virtual mirror, and he sees basically a virtual reflection of himself. And he sort of looks at it, uh, makes some faces, waves, and it looks pretty much like him. And then he turns away from the mirror and looks at the room again, and he notices that across the room from where he is uh, is another desk. Sort of like if you imagine people sharing an office, you know, with desks that face each other. Um, and behind this other desk, there was Freud was sitting there. Who? Freud. Sigmund Freud? Sigmund Freud, the psychoanalyst. So uh, a, a middle-aged man with a big brown beard? He had a beard, he had glasses, and um, he was just sitting there with his hands folded in his lap. So Josh takes this all in. He's sort of sitting there and looking at Freud. Freud is looking back at him. And uh, then he hears, Josh, uh, hears the voice of a researcher coming into his ear through his VR helmet. She explained, what you're going to do is you're going to explain a problem that you're having, a personal problem that you're having to Freud, um, something that's bothering you in your life. She said, we just want you to simply tell Freud your issue. That's all. Um, and she said, take a minute, think about what you'd like to discuss. Did something immediately uh, jump to mind? Yeah, so you know, my, uh, my mom had a stroke a few years ago, and she's in a nursing home, and I'm her guardian. So she's young, she's 65, um, but because of this stroke, she like, needs 24-hour care, and she can't talk. She doesn't have any words anymore. So it's a very tough thing for me. We, we, I, I thought really hard about where she should live. I, I live here in New York. Um, my mom lives in Virginia. And Josh said he debated uh, where to place her for a very long time. Like, should he put her in a nursing home in New York so that uh, he can be close to her, or should he put her in a nursing home in Virginia where he would be far away? She has all these friends and family members down there. So in the end, I decided to you know, find a place for her there where there's lots of people who can visit her. So I go down maybe once every month or six weeks to see my mom, but then every weekend, you know, someone from this group of friends or family relatives visits her down there. Whereas if she were up here, you know, I'd be the only person. Um, so that's the decision I made. But, um, but you don't feel really happy about it. Yeah, you know, I feel uh, guilty about it. You know, like he was a terrible son. And he says he would have that feeling especially bad each week when uh, some friends of his mom would go visit her in a nursing home, and then they'd send him an email update saying, hey, this is how your mom is doing. And even if she was doing really well, every time he would read one of those emails, his stomach would just drop. This, this problem, this emotion, feeling guilty, is one I've felt for a while. Is this the right thing to do? You know, did I make the right choice? So I said to Freud, <laughs> I said, uh, my mom is in a nursing home in another state, and... Friends and family visit her, and they send me reports on how she's doing, and I, I always feel really bad when I get these reports. And this is said in your voice. If you'd gazed at the mirror while you were talking, would you be saying it? Yeah. So after he said this to Freud... The world sort of uh, faded out to black, and then it faded back in. And suddenly, his entire point of view on this virtual space had shifted. He was no longer in... Where he was, he was across the room now, behind the desk that had just been opposite him, and he was now inside the body of Freud. And he, he looked down at his new Freud body, and he was wearing a, a white shirt, a gray suit. Uh, there was a mirror next to that desk, and he, he looks at himself. Um, I have the little beard, you know, everything. Looked just like Freud. Um, but the main thing that was really surprising was that across, I could see myself. So this is the avatar of me now. Um, and I watched myself uh, 
say what I had just said. So, oh wow! Oh. So it, pr- it plays it back. It plays it back. So first the um, the uh, I can see my I'm sitting in the chair and sort of uncomfortable. I'm moving around. I take my hands and um, put them in my lap and fold them together, and then I take them apart and I put them together. You know, I can watch myself be nervous. And then I saw, uh, then I saw myself say what I just said. My mom is in a nursing home in another state, and friends and family visit her, and they send me reports, um, you know, in my voice. And I, I always feel really bad, um, wow. m- you know, moving the way I move, and it was just like me watching myself. Um, and I guess the best way I can describe that was it was uh, moving. What? Moving. Moving like, like as in me emotionally moving. Yeah, emotionally moving. I mean, I, I felt, um, uh, I, I don't know if this is going to make any sense, but you know how there's a point in your life where you realize that your parents are just people? Yes. Yeah. It was kind of like that, except it was me. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Did you feel uh, closer to that guy or, or? I felt bad for him. You felt bad for him? Sorry. Yeah, I, I, my, my, uh, my, my feelings went out to this other person, who was me. <laughs> so as he's having this empathetic reaction, as Freud, looking back at himself, the researcher's voice appears again in his ear and says, uh, what would you like to say to that guy over there, hmm. to your patient? So I didn't know what to say, so I said, um, why do you think you feel bad? That was, the, that, that, was, was a, that was a good Freudian kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think you feel bad? Soon as he asked uh, that question, he went back in his body, his virtual body, and he's now staring back at virtual Freud, and he sees a playback of virtual Freud asking him the question that he had just asked. I watched Freud say this to me. Why do you think you feel bad? Except that when Freud talks, they had some thing in the program that made his voice extra deep. Oh, interesting. Like, and, a, like a format shifter. Yeah. And yeah. so his voice didn't sound like my voice. It sounded like another person's voice. So it seemed like, you know, coming from somebody else. Well, how did you respond as, you, as now you? I said, I feel bad because it doesn't seem right that I'm living far away. I, I said, I just feel bad to be, to be far away. It doesn't make any sense. Once again, he switches bodies and now he is Freud again. Staring back at himself. I watched Freud say this to me. Why do you think you feel bad? Except that when Freud talks, they had some Oops. thing in the program <laughs> that made his voice. And I watched myself say this. I feel bad because it doesn't seem right. And then as Freud, I said, well, why, why are you far away then? Then once again, he goes back into his own body. Freud says uh, the following across the room to him. Why are you far away then? And I said, well, because um, if my mom lived in New York, I'd be the only person here. But if she's down in where she lives, then there's other people to visit her. (laughs) One more switch. Back in Freud's body. Um, And I said, so it sounds like there's there's a reason why why you live where you live. Um, So if you know that, why, why why do you still feel bad? And once again, he flies out of Freud's body back into his own body, and he hears Freud say the thing that he had just said to himself as Freud. If you know that, why, why, do, you, why do you still feel bad? Um, I said something like, um, you're right. <laughs> wow. I pushed the button and went back into Freud. And then as Freud, I said, you know, it sounds like the, uh, the thing that's making you unhappy, which is making you feel bad, which is getting these reports from these people, is actually the whole reason why you decided to live in these, you know, to have keep your mom where she is. Like, there's a, a loop, right? It's like these, these reports I get from my mom's friends make me feel bad, but the whole reason why I decided to leave her in this place in Virginia is specifically so that there are friends who can visit her. Hmm. Like there's this classic idea in psychotherapy called the reframe which is that you take a problem and you reframe it so that problem becomes a solution. And Josh says in that moment when he was sort of co-authoring both sides of this conversation, he was able to do that. He had this really simple, basic epiphany that his guilt was actually connected to something that was good. 
Like he chose to keep his mom in Virginia so her friends could visit her more. And each time the friends visited, he felt bad. But that meant they were visiting a lot. And so that bad feeling he was having, the fact that he felt it so much, was in a way just evidence that he had made, if not the right decision, then at least a decision that made sense. I never had that thought before. The experience I had talking to myself as Freud was, um, was nothing like the experience I had in my own head turning, these, turning this issue over and over. When I was back in my own body and Freud said it to me, I was just like, I just felt like, um, wow. That's so Good amazing. point. <laughs> <laughs> that was my but, but wouldn't your next thought be, what the hell is going on here? Why am I able in this utterly fictive situation mm -hmm. to split myself in two and heal myself? Well, I, I took the headset off, and I sat there for a little while while the researchers looked at me, um, trying to make sense of it. And I, I think what what I keep coming back to is the seeing yourself just as a person. Not as you, not with all the uh, complexities and um, stuff that is in y your self experience of being yourself. But Josh says, um, this is the part I find really interesting, that like when you are in your body, which you pretty much always are, uh, like you've got all these thoughts and all these feelings and they, those are attached to that body. Sort of like when you go home for Thanksgiving and you walk into a uh, your parents' kitchen and suddenly you feel like you're 10 again? Because the context of that kitchen is super powerful. It brings back all of those thoughts. Well, the context of your body is like equally powerful, if not more. I mean, all those thoughts and feelings that you're having are constrained by the body that you're having those thoughts in. And if you are in a virtual space, he says, and you can leave that body behind and go into a new one, your brain can suddenly let go of all those thoughts and assumptions. When I'm embodied as Freud, not only do I look different and think this is my body, but I feel different and I have different types of thoughts and I see um, people differently. And Josh says what he saw when he was Freud looking back at himself was just a guy that needed help. When someone comes to you and asks for help, your feelings are not complicated. They're just tenderness, kindness, I, I, my, your instinct is to help them. And he says he was able to bring that very simple way of being back to himself. Did it, did it make a difference? Did you walk out of that with, with a different feeling about yourself? I did. I, I think um, I've had a feeling of, I think it revised my feeling about who I was a little. I think it made me feel a little more, um, I, I don't even have a word for it just a little more human. Hmm. So, Brian, this is, you, you get the last word. I, uh, um, that is so weird. <laughs> that you could just, you could just plaster yourself onto a foreign body, like Sigmund Freud's. Or he could have done it to his dad, in which case he would have just been his mother's husband. But yeah. that somehow the body that you are part of becomes somehow uh, changes your brain uh, it's uh... to me this is really interesting because the history of chatbots begins with a chatbot program written in the 60s by an MIT professor uh, named Joseph Weizenbaum and the program was called Eliza and it was designed to mimic this non-directive Rogerian therapist where you would say I'm feeling sad it would just throw it back to you as a kind of mad lib I'm sorry to hear you're sad why are you sad um, and Weizenbaum was famously horrified when he walked in on his secretary just like spilling her life's innermost thoughts and feelings to this program that she had seen him write. You know, so there's no, there's no mystery there. But he came away from that experience feeling appalled at the degree to which people will sort of project um, human intention onto just technology. And his reaction was to pull the plug on his own research project, and for the rest of his life, he became one of the leading critics against chatbot technology and against AI in general. Um, and I think it's really powerful to juxtapose that against the story that you've just shared, which tells us that there's, there's, more, there's more to the picture than that, that there are ways 
to use this technology um, in a way that doesn't sort of distance us, but in a way that sort of enables us to be more fully human. Um, and I, I think that's a wonderful way to think about it. Well, why don't we just leave it there, uh, pleasantly. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have some thanks to give. We have particular, particular thanks to give to the person who made this, uh, this whole, this whole cybersphere around us possible. That's Lauren Coons, who's in the audience. Uh, Lauren, can you stand up? Come on, yeah, Lauren, like uh, that's Lauren. She says, by the way, so that you know, because because you were get, getting it on a little bit with the uh, with the that that. Her, <laughs> she says that her computer does seem to attract the hotties of the world and it seems to just uh, is there something about the way you've just coded this thing that it seems to bring out the libido in, in people is that your no it's about the people over, um, it's a sad fact so this bot over 20% of people who talk to her and millions of conversations every week actually make romantic overtures and that's pretty consistent across all of the bots on our platform. So there's something wrong with us, not the robot. <laughs> or right, you know, all right. Or right, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Lauren, what, what was, what's the bot's actual uh, name? It's not Strawberry or Blueberry. What? Yeah, it's Mitsuku, and it's the most recent winner of the Loebner Prize, so the current reigning champion. Wow. Oh, so we had the, we, so you, well, just for the fun of it, we might just make the false claim that we just won the Loebner Prize with the Loebner Prize winning machine, and uh, we didn't, but. No, no, Robert, <laughs> you um, won, you All right, won. well, we have a, a lot of people to thank. Uh, th thank you to, uh, is, it, is it Pandora Bots? Is yes, that right? Yes, yeah. Pandora Bots, which is a platform that powers uh, conversational AI software for hundreds of thousands of global Brands and developers and pervy humans, I guess. Uh, <laughs> learn more about their enterprise and offering and services at PandoraBots.com. Thanks also to Chance Bone for designing the Robert or Robot artwork for tonight. To Nate Milton for his killer animations you saw at the beginning of the show. And of course, to Brian Christian for coming here to talk with us yes, tonight. Thank you. And to you, to... Uh, and to you guys... Uh, you know, I, I know that sometimes when you come into the room and there, there are these two people that you've kind of, you've heard for a while, and they don't look quite right. We, now we do, but <laughs> we know that when we walk in, there, there's always this little <gasps> thing <laughs> that happens, like, you know, too hairy, too round, too bald, too fat, too skinny, too something. And, and it's very nice that you were so modest with your with your quiet shock. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. So thank you. Before you guys go, we have to do a little bit of showbiz, some, some mistakes that we made through the show. We have to pick them up at, as if we never made those mistakes. So we're going to like, we're going to edit them in. So a uh, couple of things. Actually, we, can you read these uh, names right here? Yeah. Because I'm not sure we did those yet for the credits. Oh, these are, these are the credits. Yeah, they'll come uh, I'll just read them here. Okay. Do I just say them? Yeah, thanks also too. Oh. Thanks also to Lauren Coons. We already did that. Thanks also to Lauren Coons, to Andrew Otto, to Rose Link, to Barbara Svenick, to Neat Milton, to Josh Tobias, to Jason Richardson, to Ben Bloom, and to Leah Vincent. Leah Vincent. Leah Vincent. Jason Richardson. Barbara C-V-E-N-I-C. What do you think? Uh, I don't Chivenic. know. Sivenick. Link. Rose Link. Rose Link. Okay. <laughs> all right, give me that. <laughs> uh, all right, so there's, and then I, apparently I said your name wrong when I introduced you. Uh, so let's go back. Because you christened him. I think I, I christened yeah, you. Yeah, you christened him. Well, sorry that's all right. That. That's his kid. Uh, all right. Christians. So, yeah. Coonsie. 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 Oh. Oh, wow. Effenheimer. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, let me do it. Let me do it with Coonsie. Yep. La Lauren Coonsie. Lauren Coonsie. Lauren Coonsie. <laughs> and call her out like you did earlier. And, and yes. Yeah. Are you Lauren Coonsie? Like that. There she is. That's Lauren Coonsie. Yes. <laughs> okay. Perfect. And um, let me introduce Brian Christian again without the sun at the end. Uh, and to explain the Loebner Prize, we want to talk to a guy who is actually in it, who actually won it, a Loebner champion. Please welcome to the stage writer Brian Christian. Please welcome to the stage Brian Christian. And I think that's it. Okay, that's only three mistakes? I think we only had three. Okay. Susie, is that right? Okay. Okay, thank, thank you Thank you guys all. so much. Thank you.